Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Chip Cytometry Multiplexing, Practical Approachable Spatial Biology. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Canopy Biosciences. To learn more, please visit canopybiosciences.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Jay Spencer Schwartz, Product Manager at, of Chip Cytometry Instrumentation at Canopy Biosciences. Spencer, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for kind of tuning in and having me. Um, so uh, what kind of prompted this uh, talk or maybe uh, a way to introduce this is um, uh, the concept of spatial biology is, is certainly, uh, it's, uh, it's a hot topic. It's very interesting and people are starting to see the power of being able to uh, not only deeply phenotype a particular cell set or find a, you know, a very specialized cell set, um, but also give that spatial context to figure out what's going on uh, within a, uh, a piece of texture, uh, tissue rather, uh, considering its entire architecture. Um, so <clears throat> coming at it from that point of view, uh, this is uh, uh, very new um, and it's also very interesting. Um, but what I would like to do today is kind of give that whole uh, conversation a little bit of context. Um, <clears throat> so maybe to start this off, I'd like to kind of relay a bit of a story here. Um, so uh, before uh, Canopy Biosciences, I was a, uh, a advanced biosystems uh, specialist uh, for a, uh, a larger uh, instrumentation company. Um, so one of the final uh, demonstrations of uh, equipment that I did uh, was for someone that was, and it's probably going to sound pretty familiar, uh, but they uh, had a piece of tissue. It was FFPE, it was archived tissue. They had stained it with 12 different stains. Um, and they wanted me to use my piece of equipment to unmix those 12 signals and uh, give them a spatial definition, essentially, uh, of what was going on with those 12 signatures. Um, so I didn't know it at the time, uh, but actually what I was doing uh, was a demonstration that I could uh, use my piece of equipment uh, to perform a technique called cytomap. Uh, so anymore, cytomap has kind of become a staple of uh, this sort of spatial, uh, spatial context work. Um, so, you know, this very similar concept where we're going to collect fluorescence images, uh, we're going to use image analysis in order to define cells, uh, and then we're going to arrange those cells uh, into phenotypes and then cast those phenotypes back into uh, their, uh, back into the tissue so we can see what's going on. Um, so all this is really to say that, you know, this is, uh, though uh, some of the methodologies are absolutely cutting edge, uh, the intention really has been around for a while. People have wanted to multiplex uh, uh, cellular signals for a long time. Um, so the thing to consider is that, you know, really multiplexing is, is not necessarily new. Um, it's just that the, man, uh, the, uh, the techniques rather were relatively manual, relatively slow in order to build up those data sets. Uh, so really what um, you know, technologists have been able to bring to this field is a way to do this in an automated fashion, a way to do this at, you know, very high plex. Um, so kind of naturally that brings a discussion to, well, how, how high plex can you go? Uh, what is the best resolution that you can give me? Uh, these are valid questions, uh, and these certainly have their, uh, have their place within the context of, you know, this whole kind of uh, spatial, uh, sp spatial biology in general. Um, there are certainly reasons why you would say, you know, generate very high multiplex uh, cell maps, uh, very high multiplex um, uh, complete tissue architectures. Um, and there's very successful programs where they've used these technologies uh, to their, um, uh, to complete these. Um, but there's still room, most definitely, for people that are just getting into multiplexing. So someone that maybe has a research question that could use multiplexing in order to answer it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to be a lab that specializes in multiplexing or that specializes in spatial biology. Um, so what I'd like to go through uh, with you for the next uh, half an hour or so um, is uh, this idea that chip cytometry um, and the instrumentation for that is called the, uh, the cellscape, um, but that these are a really nice tool set uh, 
uh, for somebody that is getting into spatial context, uh, but doesn't necessarily, again, want to specialize in uh, spatial, uh, spatial biology. Uh, so again, you know, the, the three things to consider as, as this information is presented is, is number one, that, you know, multiplexing is not new. Uh, the man, uh, methods just need to be automated. Um, <clears throat> very key to this is that most research questions, if, if we're going to cast these as a set of markers or a, a set of signals that we're looking for, uh, most researchers already have those signals in mind. They already know what they're researching or what they're looking for. Uh, they just want to do this in a multiplex fashion. So it's not that you know anyone in particular really wants to put 80 markers onto a piece of tissue just to see what happens. It's really typically that you're trying to um, figure out a particular mechanism or a biological mechanism within the context of everything else that's going on uh, in a piece of tissue. Um, so that's really, uh, again, kind of what chip cytometry and the cellscape provide. Uh, and the last point here, and this is kind of ancillary to the uh, to this talk, but really very important to this methodology in general, um, is that faster, higher plex, uh, larger field to view, all of these things, um, they're really only important if you can maintain your data quality. Uh, so everything that comes downstream of that and everything that will be archived for those, you know, uh, computational studies you might do uh, even years from now, uh, definitely benefit from very high data quality. Uh, the best or better you can get, uh, the better your final experiment will be. Okay. <clears throat> A little bit of uh, even context from that. So what is chip cytometry in general? Uh, so chip cytometry is, uh, is a way of doing uh, cyclic immunostating so that we can uh, build up very, very large sets of biomarkers. Um, so we're looking at a piece of, uh, a piece of tissue here that is, uh, uh, this is a colon uh, section um, on which we've actually stained 15 different biomarkers. So the way that we do this is through iterative five-plex staining, so one to five markers. Uh, we can use third-party commercial vendor antibodies in order to uh, achieve this. And we basically, you know, if we want this set of 15, uh, we would build up these as sets of five, 10, 15 at a time, and we collate those images together. Um, so from kind of collection to analysis here, uh, the first thing we do is we, uh, we stain for and collect these uh, differential image sets, one for each marker. Uh, we then use image analysis in order to define what a cell is within this uh, image, and then also uh, then assess for uh, the uh, expression value of each of those markers that we stain for. Uh, we then cast that in dot plots. So bivariate dot plots, the very same thing. Uh, that you uh, would see in flow cytometry. It's actually the very same workflow you would use in flow cytometry, uh, where we're going to apply gates and then subgates and then sub subgates in order to define uh, these different cell populations. And then the key to that is once we've defined our cell populations again through you know known ontologies. This is the same workflow as uh, cytometry, um, flow cytometry. Uh, we can then cast that information back into the image and actually tell for each of these cells, you know, that this is a CD8 key cell because in our uh, gating, we know that it's CD45 positive, CD3 positive, CD8 positive, and CD4 negative. Um, and we can make phenotypes just as, uh, a, as extensive as you would like to. Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, the one additional thing that we're bringing to this with Cellscape is now we can do that at much higher resolution and much higher throughput. Uh, so this is actually from kind of our legacy instrument, and this is more akin to what you would get out of our, our kind of current offering to the cells cave. Um, so <clears throat> very large field of view, uh, very nice high resolution images. Um, one thing I love to point out here is that for AI67, uh, you can actually start to see, you know, uh, uh, some uh, transcript counts and things like that. So it's actually very, very high resolution, but still keeping the throughput. Uh, so again, the basic methodology really has not changed much for chip cytometry uh, when we introduced the cellscape, which was this year. Um, so we've still got the same, uh, um, it's a cell, the same methodology rather that we've been using since 2009, uh, but now we can just do it faster. We can do it in an automated way. Okay, <clears throat> so kind of uh, the meat and potatoes of today I would like to talk about here. Um, so the, the things that, again, you know, kind of make all this happen uh, are uh, HDR imaging. Um, very importantly, this idea of using the clone genome. So that's really kind of, uh, that's the heart of being able to take somebody that has an idea for a project, what they would like to use spatial biology for, 
um, but don't really have the uh, don't have the experience of uh, of using those methodologies and walk that person uh, to a place where they can actually successfully use these technologies. Uh, this is really key to that. Um, and the last part, of course, just to kind of hit on, because I, I personally think this is really important, is just this idea of improved resolution uh, and also uh, not then um, uh, detracting from the throughput to gain the higher resolution. Okay. So kind of introducing this uh, idea of what we call open source reagents. Um, so the actual workflow of uh, tick cytometry kind of looks like this. Uh, we essentially take, you know, any any piece of tissue, uh, essentially anything that you can section. So this includes uh, FFPE archived tissue. This includes fresh frozen tissue. Uh, anything else that you can think of that you can uh, you can fix and then section is something that we can use with chip cytometry. Uh, and again, that's rather unique in this uh, particular arena because a lot of times all the chemistry that then comes after that is very specialized to a specific case, use case rather. In our case, we uh, we don't do that. So we really can just, just about look at anything uh, with uh, with a multiplex on top of it. Uh, just to mention too, this actually technology actually came out of trying to emulate what a flow cytometer does. Uh, so in taking that approach, we kind of get as an added benefit um, the ability to actually do this with cell suspensions. Um, so we do this a lot rather with PBMC cell suspensions. A lot of our work is in IO. Um, <clears throat> where we're uh, putting a, essentially a cell smear on one of these chips and then going through the same uh, iterative staining approach uh, and uh, phenotype collection, uh, but with cells. Um, as a, we, we haven't had a good use case from a customer yet on this. I'd be very excited if anybody would be interested in this. Um, but you know, this gives a great opportunity rather to take a look at circulating versus resident immune cells. Uh, because we can do matched samples, truly matched samples, uh, we, this is something that we can look at as well. Uh, but kind of an aside there. Um, so once uh, we have your sample on the chip, though, uh, we would break up uh, your plex into five plex stainings, meaning if we had like a 40 plex, that would be eight sets of five. Uh, we're going to stain for those five at a time. We're going to image those uh, five signals on our, uh, on our piece of tissue. Uh, we are then going to photo bleach. This is truly just uh, additional light, um, so no more uh, da uh, damaging than you know a piece of tissue in a in a in a bright room. Uh, but we're going to use photo bleaching in order to erase that signal, uh, and then we're going to stain with an additional five plus. Uh, so it's the cyclic uh, staining <laughs> cycle of uh, of staining, then imaging, and photo bleaching, stain image, photo bleach, stain image, then photo bleach rather. Um, one thing to kind of mention about this too is uh, we can also store these samples kind of mid uh, mid project um, <clears throat> in order to um, uh, basically archive them. Uh, so we can what we can do and what we often do is we might stain for say a 15 flex, um, gather whatever information we're going to gather from that 15 flex, uh, and then actually kind of rationally plan our next set of experiments. Um, so we had a really nice use case of this uh, recently with a pilot where someone did just a, a, a typical kind of immune cell uh, profiling scheme, uh, one of our standard panels we offer. Um, really liked what they saw, but then they wanted to go back and actually, in this case, we were looking at induced, uh, uh, an induced uh, uh, cancer model, uh, and they had a marker uh, for those cells that were cancer. We could actually just go right back in and using the same sample and the same data set, uh, add on top of that uh, the marker that was required to uh, to see that to see uh, who was a cancer cell and who was not. Uh, so a really nice work uh, work uh, excuse me use case that we're working on currently. Okay. Um, so again, you know what what really powers this uh, is this idea that we can really use any antibody. Um, so we have very, very loose, rather strictures on what you can what you can look at. Um, so as long as your antibody or your signal uh, can be excited using UV vis excitation, uh, as long as it emits a signal that can be seen in UV vis, uh, this is something that we can use. Um, so you know most of what we uh, it, oh excuse me it also has to of course be photo bleachable. Um, so this is actually covering kind of most early gen dyes. Uh, so things like FITSI, things like PE, things like uh, PERSI P5.5. Uh, these dyes that are often seen as not uh, particularly good for microscopy in general are actually great for chip cytometry because we actually want something that photo bleaches quickly. Um, so <clears throat> we have a, a huge archive of uh, what works and what doesn't that we uh, often walk people through. 
uh, when they're putting these assays together or using the instrument in person. But um, generally speaking, it, it very much kind of opens up the uh, um, your uh, ability to look at individual markers. So kind of taking that a step further in that you know, kind of explanation here, uh, if we take a look at kind of comparing chip cytometry where we truly can use any antibody uh, versus what I'll just generally call proprietary detection, but really what I'm referring here to is, you know, uh, ol oligo conjugation or uh, chelating agent conjugation. Um, the one kind of, uh, you know, dangerous thing about these uh, these methods is that essentially, you know, if, if that conjugation doesn't work and uh, every indication we get is that it doesn't always work, uh, the issue is that you then you can't use that antibody. Um, <clears throat> so you can imagine that for you know most use cases, people that are using actual research, uh, this is kind of a deal breaker, or can be rather, um, especially since it's also very difficult then to uh, confirm once you've added a conjugation to your antibody that you still have the same antigenicity that you had before. So that is certainly not always just a guarantee. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, taking the chip cytometry approach, uh, the first thing we typically look for is uh, is just pre-conjugated antibodies. Uh, so there are a lot of these out there, and actually uh, there's more and more by the, uh, uh, by the month, I would even say, uh, because vendors, larger vendors, are starting to realize the power uh, in spatial biology of having these, uh, uh, these primary conjugations because you can employ these uh, well, spatial biology methods uh, in general uh, much more readily. But let's say you can't even find a preconjugation, or this is an antibody that you uh, generated in house. Uh, we can always use conjugation kits. If that doesn't work, uh, we can, of course, just rely on secondary detection. Uh, and if that doesn't work, uh, we've even had you know, more clever strategies like a bias instructive um, and even uh, more interesting conjugation, or I would say uh, strategies in general, um, <clears throat> uh, for adding a, a dye that then photo bleaches. The one kind of interesting use case I, I find here is um, in the case of this uh, AF48 and anti-AF48 um, <clears throat> use case. Uh, so here we actually have an AF48, a dye that does not bleach very well. But what we found is that there is an anti-AF48 uh, antibody that essentially quenches out that signal. Um, so instead of sitting there and trying to photo bleach this for 20 minutes or whatever it takes, we can instead add this antibody to quench that um, to quench that signal almost immediately. So again, it's just you know it's it's uh, one more tool that we can provide our customers and uh, in order to get particular signals or, or particular uh, markers uh, into into a multiplex. Lots of different options, and we rely on these all the time when we build uh, build our panels. Um, <clears throat> The major benefits of this, though, uh, and again, this is this is very much kind of coming from the the perspective of somebody that's trying to get into spatial biology. Uh, the first is it becomes much more easy to validate uh, your multiplexes. So again, because all we're really modifying is uh, the uh, what we're conjugating to or the signal, uh, we have a much less abstracted um, view of uh, of that signal when we actually apply it to a piece of tissue. Um, so for better, for worse, uh, the gold standard for most IHC work or most IF work even is still, you know, just IHC staining and single plex. Uh, the reason being, this is still what is used clinically uh, in order to make diagnoses. So there's there's very little point or it's very difficult to make the case that um, your uh, your signal of interest uh, is 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 useful in uh, your multiplex if you can't validate that in single plex. And most of the time that's done with IHC work. Um, but what's great about uh, chip cytometry is that again becomes much more direct. Uh, so here I can I can directly again compare, and this is a, a work that came out of the uh, Bush Lab um, last year. Um, I can directly compare through serial sections uh, the the signal that I'm seeing in multiplex here. We're looking at FOXP3, uh, CD8, CD3 on pancytic keratin, uh, same signals on the right. But I'm looking at a direct comparison between the two. And this becomes very important um, uh, and actually kind of uh, uh, builds on top of this idea of doing this in five plex instead of, say, 40 antibodies at a time, uh, because it's very easy to tell what cells are what. Um, and you can imagine here, especially in the I.O. case, um, that it can be actually fairly difficult to discern whether you have the right signal on the right cell if you're just looking at a bunch of immune cells. Um, that's not always relatively clear, or that's not clear at all sometimes when you're looking at a lot of cells that have, roughly speaking, the same morphology. Uh, so the 
closer you can get to a direct uh, um, kind of uh, a direct correlation between the immunofluorescence stain that you see and the IHC stain that you see, the better. And that's essentially what chip cytometry provides is almost a direct correlation between those two. So it becomes very, very easy uh, to validate these, uh, these marker sets. Um, the next thing it allows you to do really is, again, because we're using um, the same antibodies that uh, are being used for other projects, other use cases, um, it becomes very easy uh, to uh, add what uh, I kind of refer to here as novel or exotic quote unquote targets. Um, but you know, from the, the viewpoint of somebody that's making these large uh, um, spatial biology um, assay sets, um, even anything outside of the clinical uh, setting could be considered kind of novel or kind of exotic. Uh, so you'll see a lot of times, you know, the if you look at the history on uh, pretty much anybody's spatial biology platform, uh, their development history, Typically, it's something clinical, and then it goes into something that's a marine model, and then maybe whatever else happens to be interesting to them. Um, <clears throat> so the ability to go straight into even you know, a mouse model, and that first uh, image I showed was actually a, a mouse spleen, uh, can be considered kind of a, a specialized endeavor. Uh, so you can imagine you know, if you have anything outside of that, even you know, if we're looking at plants, uh, which is, yeah, is something that a, a vast majority of researchers look at, uh, suddenly it becomes very difficult to find uh, particular markers for a spatial biology platform. Uh, so again, we obviate that entirely uh, by just using the same antibodies that you would buy from BD and BioLegend and cell signaling. Um, so this is kind of our, our, our showstopper use case for this, um, but this was uh, a, a report, uh, this was in Cell Reports uh, 2019. Um, but the intention here was that uh, they had uh, these mate cells, which are uh, immune associated uh, invariant T cells. Um, <clears throat> and they had a, a pretty specific uh, question to answer, which was, um, you know, they, they had rather a, a function proposed for these cells. Uh, they thought that they might be um, uh, associated with uh, uh, tissue repair. Um, <clears throat> but, and they did uh, a lot of kind of higher flex um, uh, uh, non-spatial analysis in order to prove their point. Uh, so things like uh, uh, RNA, RNA scope, um, and uh, excuse me, the uh, and nanostring uh, to kind of in bulk show that this did in fact happen or they thought this happened, but it was all in vitro evidence. Uh, so in order to find uh, in situ evidence, they actually went back, they found clinical specimens, people that had this disease, um, and they used chip cytometry in a panel of about 30 markers in order to positively identify these mate cells. Um, so the six signals that we're looking at here are actually a downsampling of, say, 30 that were required to positively identify these cells. Um, and what they showed through chip cytometry is that, yes, indeed, these cells are in the proper place in order to have this function. Um, so it's a really nice, chip cytometry in general is a really nice way to bring in situ evidence uh, to, your, to your research program. Um, <clears throat> kind of the last part of this too, or another kind of benefit of this is it also provides, uh, just because of the architecture of the platform, a very easy way to combine multimodal techniques. Uh, so kind of the, the quote unquote holy grail of, of this um, uh, spatial biology is, is really the combination of RNA as well as protein. And if we can get RNA, DNA, protein, essentially as many uh, omics uh, readouts as we can. Um, but uh, a lot of people are starting with RNA in general uh, because they're just a very good, uh, uh, very compatible rather with DNA. Um, so kind of that, that first use case is simply, you know, uh, signals where it's, it's relatively difficult to find an antibody that works well for a piece of tissue for that marker, uh, or alternatively, there just hasn't been one that's developed. Uh, so in this case, this is uh, CD3. Of course, that's not the case there. Um, we're just showing that the, uh, the methodology works well. Um, <clears throat> but it's an easy way to combine uh, through, uh, through relatively simple combinations of, of fluorescence, um, combine these marker sets. Uh, so this is useful, again, for things, uh, markers where you have a loose signal. Uh, it's also useful for markers in spatial contexts that don't necessarily correlate well to a particular cell, but they still may be very interesting. If you consider things like cytokines, you can stain for cytokines with IF and IHC, uh, but it's almost impossible to take a look at that stain and then uh, associate that with a particular cell and, and say, in this case, like, I know that all this stain around here is coming from this cell. However, if you look at the transcripts, you can see which cells are lighting up for a particular transcript for uh, a cytokine. 
and that's better evidence of uh, better spatial context rather um, than just looking at the IF stain of the uh, of the marker particularly. Um, there's other use cases that we have that are very interesting here too. Um, so taking a look here. Um, so you know what if uh, what if your sample is is just barely a tissue. Um, so we had a really nice uh, webinar that was put on by my colleague uh, Shay uh, Hagler recently. This is on our website, uh, but this was actually taking a look at thrombosis. Um, so this is a uh, an association of cells. Uh, it is kind of a loose association. Most people consider this uh, not very well organized, um, but that's actually the key uh, um, the key thing we're kind of looking into here. Or is you know what what is the spatial organization of these thromb uh, these thrombos thromboses. Um, so we've just started this uh, this program. We should have uh, kind of a continuation of this webinar coming soon. Uh, ba but basically using chip cytometry, we could start by first, um, you know, using our uh, FFPE uh, know-how in order to section these onto uh, cover slips um, so that we could look at it in a spatial context in the first place. Um, we've gotten as far as showing that with the CD45 seeing the DNA that we can locate individual cells. And now we're working on kind of this low flex or, or single flex rather de novo marker, meaning in our, our parlance, a new marker uh, qualifying that. Uh, so again, you know, we can go through and look at these at single flex if we want to, to see where uh, these individual markers are. And one thing that I find very interesting here is some of these, like CD154, uh, these are actually platelet specific markers. So we can even take this outside of just nucleated um, mammalian cells, the things that are kind of truly exotic uh, within the kind of the spatial biology context. Uh, so this I found very exciting. Um, but it all kind of goes to that same idea that, you know, if, if you already have a research program and it happens to use something that's outside of the clinical space, um, it's kind of a shame that it's as difficult as it is for most technologies to use multiplexing. Uh, so really what we're providing here is a way to um, easily, you know, take your uh, two or three signals uh, or, or markers uh, or mechanisms that you're interested in and study those in a truly spatial context. Uh, so that I find particularly exciting about this platform and this technology. <laughs> um, the last part of this, so, you know, I, each of these sections I'd like to kind of bring back to like, okay, we, we have this thing called the cellscape. What does this provide? Um, so <clears throat> uh, again, kind of that first slide described uh, this idea that we, uh, you know, that, that, uh, Multiplexing is, has been around for a while, but the issue is that a lot of these methods are, are really manual. Um, so what this uh, cell state actually brings here, first and foremost, is a way of automating these stains. So you can imagine if you have you know, five stains at a time, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, however, if the intention is to add 30 or 40 different markers onto a piece of tissue and do that cyclically, uh, suddenly that becomes kind of uh, daunting. Um, so we've uh, included uh, automated automated, essentially an automated stainer, along with the cellscape that does that for you. Uh, so we can actually program in up to 75 different reagents. Uh, each of these uh, vials will take up to five or five, uh, five plus co cocktails. Uh, and we can go through and then apply these, image them, photo bleach, and do that all automatically. Uh, so again, that's, you know, up to 75 if we wanted to do it completely walk away. And of course, we can, you know, we can swap out these tubes uh, and essentially do an unlimited flux number. Okay, um, so the next part of this is uh, adding what I refer to here as kind of biologically relevant data. Uh, so this is kind of split into two parts. Uh, the first is the introduction of this technology called uh, HDR imaging. And the second is, is simply obtaining a uh, very high spatial resolution uh, imaging. Uh, so starting with HDR, why, why do we need HDR here? Um, so, you know, we're, we're still using a microscope in order to image an IF signal. Uh, so there's certain, you know, kind of uh, limitations to that, uh, particularly if you talk about, you know, in uh, typical context, you're talking about a single exposure. Um, so the basic problem is this, is that, you know, if I use a very long exposure to capture, uh, say, quantitative image images uh, regarding a very dim signal. So um, that's kind of the, that's the typical trade-off here. So if you have a very dim signal, we're going to use a camera to capture that signal. We have to use a very long exposure. However, when I do that, um, 
I'm going to uh, essentially oversaturate anything that might be brighter than that low signal. Alternatively, if I have a very bright thing that I'm looking at, that necessitates a very low exposure, which is, of course, going to undersaturate uh, these dim cells. So you see where you can kind of get yourself into this kind of catch-22 where no particular camera uh, exposure can catch both the bright signal as well as the low signal. Um, so what we're looking at at the right here is uh, a, a, this is a CD4 cells, uh, kind of a cell smear. Um, so CD4 on PBMCs, what we're looking at here, uh, is actually trivariate. Uh, so most of these PBMCs don't actually express CD4 at all. Uh, some of them express it dimly, those are monocytes, and some of them are blazing bright, and those are T cells. Uh, so what we'll walk through here is an exposure series where here we're taking a, a relatively low exposure in order to get nice contrast on our bright cells. Um, so this next slide then is adding an additional longer exposure. And what I'm marking here by this uh, white arrow is the addition of this little dim cell here that was actually missing entirely from the, uh, the original image that you saw. Uh, so as I add more exposures, you can actually see uh, that we're adding more data to the scene. So it's the same cells, it's just all the, uh, the only thing we're changing is the camera exposure. Uh, but you start to see something else as our exposures get, uh, relatively speaking, too long. Um, so this white here is actually oversaturation. So anywhere you see white, I've actually topped out the camera. I'm not getting any quantitative information out of that. Uh, so if I take this all the way to its extent, so here I'm looking at the entire scene. I've got, uh, you know, all these cells uh, are lit up. Uh, but you can see I get quite a bit of white here, too. Uh, so again, there's no single exposure that can actually capture the full extent of the expression on each of these cells. And the same thing happens with tissue as well. Um, <clears throat> so what it means is you're actually truncating. By picking a particular exposure, you're truncating the data that you're getting out of that sample. Um, and there's no specific, you know, perfect exposure. Um, you're either picking uh, bright cells or you're picking dim cells. So you know, generally speaking, this, this has real consequences when you take it to the phenotype. Uh, so when you take this to the phenotype then, so again, this is taking a look at data that's made it through the entirety of our pipeline, where we're looking at expression. Each of these is a cell. Uh, we're looking at their expression of CD8 versus CD3. Um, so these uh, double positives here are actually CD8 T cells. Uh, what you'll notice, this is some of our competitors' data. This is actually, this population is entirely missing. And again, the reason for that is not necessarily the, you know, the acuity of the system, uh, spatial acuity, or the ability to collect um, uh, low or high signals. It's just that um, a, a uh, I would say in this case, a, a longer exposure was picked in order to, uh, to find that, which then oversaturated uh, these high cells. So all to say that you really do kind of need multi-exposure imaging, um, HDR imaging, in order to... Um, absolutely uh, uh, kind of give an absolute quantification to uh, to your cell populations. Um, and this is being seen in other kind of uh, correlated, correlated rather fields as well. Uh, David Brim has just put out a paper that shows that you actually see the same effect in IHC uh, when you're scoring between say a three and a four versus a one and a two, um, that the scoring uh, ability is actually much lower for that high three and four uh, case differentiation Again, because you're essentially oversaturating the uh, oversaturating the signal. Um, we also see this in general fluorescence, where people uh, like uh, the uh, the Massachusetts General um, Systems Biology Corps um, is taking a look at this with confocal microscopy and collecting multiple um, uh, different essentially exposure images at once, uh, just in typical uh, microscopy. Um, <clears throat> again, because it, you know, it increases your ability to do segmentation later down the line, uh, it increases your ability to see, you know, dynamic processes that might be happening that are over several orders of magnitude and intensity. Um, it's just, it's a very useful and uh, better way to collect images. Um, the other half of this then is... Uh, Uh, is really kind of high spatial acuity. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is essentially kind of right to left. Um, so this at 10,000 nanometers per pixel, uh, this is kind of the information that you get out of, say, a geomics. And the reason we use that as an example is because that's really one of the first kind of key uh, spatial biology technologies, uh, again, based on transcript elements. Uh, but we can see the actual resolution that you get out of it is, uh, is, is pretty low. 
Um, and they even, you know, they state that really what they're looking at is kind of a functional group of cells, not necessarily a single cell, uh, which is fine. Um, <clears throat> if you take that a step further down to 1,000 nanometers per pixel, uh, this is uh, roughly speaking what you can get out of a CYTOF. Again, you know, a very uh, uh, long uh, spatial biology with a long history. Um, <clears throat> steer, you know, you can see you could probably make out the difference between cell borders, but it's relatively difficult to um, assign a particular signal to a particular cell here. Uh, if we take that to 500 nanometers per pixel, uh, there's uh, current spatial biology platforms that offer this kind of technology. Uh, here too, you know, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on, but this really is, I would, I would stop this at um, really saying that this is cellular or single cell resolution. Uh, what we're very excited about here with Cellscape um, is that we actually take that to 182 nanometers per pixel. Uh, so here, what I'm trying to define here by this white arrow, um, <clears throat> is you can actually see kind of subcellular resolution or subcellular details. You know, so instead of just saying, well, this signal is on this particular cell, we can actually start to say, well, this cell, uh, this signal is on this particular, say, organelle. Uh, that, in my opinion, is very exciting, uh, again, because, you know, we can do this uh, en masse and in an automated fashion. Um, so even though, um, you know, the, the argument goes that we really don't have the ability to analyze for this right now, uh, I would say anymore that, that that argument that was even made in January along those lines really doesn't hold anymore because of all the uh, interesting things that have happened with uh, artificial intelligence, even over the last year, over 2022. So I think you're going to very quickly uh, see that we do gain the ability to do true, you know, kind of on mass with single cell resolution, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> so again, kind of what is uh, ending with what the cellscape bring to this? Um, so you know, you can always attain higher spatial acuity. Um, you know, you just get a, a, a higher and higher numerical aperture objective, uh, a better quality objective. Rather. Um, the issue is that typically, uh, when you do that, you're you're typically reducing your field of view. Um, so, <clears throat> in uh, spatial scanning or attaining a spatial, uh, uh, if, if we want to basically collect the entire tissue, uh, we need a way to uh, um, a scan across uh, scan across the tissue and collate those images. Uh, so that's the way almost all of these technologies work, if not all of them. Um, so if I wanted to uh, collect this entire piece of tissue that we're looking at, I would have to build this up through individual fields of view here. Uh, so really what we're showing here, so this is, I kind of picked this as a, a typical case, um, but this is an Orca Fusion, kind of a 2K by 2K, 6.5 uh, pixel pitch camera. This is kind of a, a, a typical uh, camera, uh, so to speak. Uh, so out of this, it would take about 21 fields of view in order to capture this entire piece of tissue, and you would get about 325 nanometer pixel, pixel sampling out of it. Uh, so again, you know, this first number, 21 fields of view, that's basically how fast can we go. Um, the On the right, uh, 325 nanometers, that's how nice an image can we generate. Um, so what Cellscape is bringing to uh, this equation then uh, is actually not just better acuity, uh, better spatial acuity rather, but actually it does this faster. Um, so we can actually collect the same 182 nanometer uh, pixel resolution over just 15 fields of view. Uh, so again, you know, the, the less pictures I take, the faster this process goes. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, that's definitely a goal. But again, we don't want to, uh, um, we don't want to sacrifice spatial acuity for that. Uh, so one of the things that Cellscape brings to this equation is, again, the ability to collect very, very high spatial acuity data but do it quickly. Um, if we're okay with a little bit of a hit uh, to resolution, but we just want to go even faster still, uh, we have another modality for this instrument where it can actually collect the same uh, uh, area of tissue uh, in just three or so fields of view uh, and actually still maintain like uh, 365 nanometer pixels. Uh, so again, you know, we are able to generate uh, with open source antibodies and uh, and uh, and HDR imaging uh, both a very high spatial acuity image and then also do this in a high survey or a high throughput mode, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, kind of the last thing we add to this is, um, you know, again, just for the idea of uh, multiplexing and easy use. Uh, we have a large pix or a, a large rather uh, imaging field uh, so that you can properly utilize that faster speed. Uh, and we also have the ability to do this uh, in, in uh, sets of four. So we can actually image and uh, process up to four samples at a time. 
Um, other fun thing I find about this is you can actually also do four entirely separate experiments if you're interested in that, uh, because all these fluidics are actually independent. Um, <clears throat> the last part to kind of hit on here is uh, the idea of data analysis. So I know this is, is a major concern for people as well, uh, because collecting all this information is one thing, but again, you know, you, you have to be able to utilize it. And that's what I've seen as a major uh, kind of hurdle, rather, or, uh, you know, large activation energy to labs that are not specialized in this field, um, is they don't necessarily know what to do with the data um, after they've collected it. So essentially what they have is a large collection of images. Um, what the heck do we do with it? Um, so to kind of discuss that, I've, uh, I've kind of mapped out our entire our data analysis pipeline here from beginning to end. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is here that, you know, we collect these HDR series. Uh, we then uh, we collate those into uh, a single HDR image uh, for each of those. We then collate every single channel that you put together. Um, and then we uh, we do a background correction so you get a true kind of normalized or a true uh, a true idea of what the the signal that's actually coming from your um, from your marker. Uh, from there, then internally we have a segmentation tool that actually tells you where cells are within that image, uh, and then we have a further fluorescence calculation where you simply use bivariate gating uh, in order to assign cell phenotypes, and then you can cast that back into the cast that back into the image. Um, so the idea of showing all this is really, you know, the, the key to um, kind of the key to generating that that understanding here is is knowing what the pipeline is doing and then also, uh, you know, giving people those uh, hooks into the data pipeline uh, so that they can use this stuff to their uh, kind of utmost advantage. Uh, so in our case, you know, we, we have a way to export essentially every single step of this roadmap. Uh, so if you do have image analysis export, um, <clears throat> we uh, we can export, say, these guys as OME TIFFs. OME TIFFs are about as uh, open source as you can get. Most, if not all, image analysis platforms can take them. Um, if we take this all the way through to the analysis, we can even give you the analysis output as a CSV. Uh, so things like CytoMap can use, uh, can use uh, that data. Uh, but again, we try to make this easy and try to make it as open as possible. Uh, so that is kind of described here, but just, you know, just some concrete examples of places to go with this type of data. And I, I like to point these out because a lot of uh, a lot of the, these types of data sets that are coming from competitors, you can do the same thing. Um, but uh, if, if, if you have someone that knows uh, Indica Labs Halo or you have someone that knows uh, Visio Farm, uh, even NIS Elements, um, these are all programs that work well with our data set. They work well with most data sets. Um, <clears throat> additionally, I definitely uh, I, I point out another kind of newcomer to this field, which is Enable Medicine. Uh, so Enable Medicine actually does this all in the cloud. They use this with uh, very very large compute uh, server schemes uh, in order to get through what can be sometimes very massive amounts of data. Um, so instead of you know setting your laptop uh, to to run a particular assay for you know over the weekend, a lot of times they can get that same task done, that same analysis task done in you know hours. Uh, if you're looking uh, again for kind of open so open source uh, uh, or freeware uh, schemes, um, these are just as important, frankly, because they are often the tools that are most. Uh, these are often the tools that are most um, uh, developed by the community, by the research community. Um, we have ways of hooking into those as well. Uh, so again, you know, my my solid recommendations for single image analysis are definitely uh, ImageJ. Uh, kind of a newer comer is uh, QPath. QPath is a fantastic way of looking at these uh, larger uh, whole swide image uh, acquisitions. Um, and even Cell Profiler, which basically takes, um, uh, it's, it's more useful for cell, um, cell suspensions uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> for, uh, uh, not necessarily intact tissue with lots of different phenotypes. I'm sorry, lots of different morphologies, but it is another way that's well accepted to look at uh, individual tissues. Um, <clears throat> the idea being basically that you know we're uh, we're very much uh, again with that open source and in our uh, intention of providing this data, um, making it easy to use this data. Rather, we want to be as compatible with, as possible with other tools so that you can use those tools and the resources around those. Uh, the best that you can. Okay, cool. 
and this is uh, uh, in this final slide is just mentioning that we can again do the same thing with just the uh, the post analysis or uh, post analysis data as well. So if you'd rather do our entire analysis, find phenotypes, find the cells that had those phenotypes, you can then use that information uh, to put those into cluster maps uh, and, and whatever else is uh, uh, interesting to you, and do that very easily. There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, again, kind of wrapping up, what uh, what we really find to be the, um, the important uh, aspects of um, kind of spatial biology for the masses uh, is you really need to be able to use versatile reagents. Uh, you need to be able to use those from trusted vendors. Uh, so again, there's no particular reason, especially if you use cyclic immunostaining like we do, to reinvent the, the wheel rather by using uh, specific conjugation schemes to, to oligos, chelating agents, or anything. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the next part is, uh, you know, you, you really do need to be able to use uh, or collect rather what we call biologically relevant data. Uh, but really what that means is, you know, you need to collect the full breadth of expression uh, on a particular marker as well as high enough acuity spatial resolution uh, to sort of future proof this particular data set. Because a lot of times people do collect and maybe not analyze until six months or a year from now. And you really want to be able to keep up with those analysis pipelines if you can. Um, and the last part is really, again, kind of, uh, you know, chip cytometry is a methodology. Uh, Cellscape is an instrument. Uh, so what Cellscape really brings to this equation is a, an instrument that's uh, specifically geared or specifically engineered for chip cytometry in that it provides, you know, quick automation of staining, um, quick scanning, and all of this is kind of seamless and automated. Well, cool. With that, uh, I really appreciate your time, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have here. Take a look at those. Yes. Thank you, Spencer. Um, very informative presentation. Um, and as said, we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And now let's get started. So our first question is, um, how many units or instruments are installed? Absolutely. Um, so for uh, chip cytometry in general, I would include our legacy instrument as well as our, our brand new cellscape. Um, so legacy placements are, uh, are 50. Uh, so we have 50 of these instruments. Uh, and we've actually just uh, placed our first cellscape uh, here in the United States um, at uh, MD Anderson. Uh, we also have another couple that are on the way uh, that are going towards Europe as well. Um, so I would say in general, to kind of answer that question for you, if, if you search for uh, the term chip cytometry, that'll bring up, you know, kind of every institution that's that's used it for the most part, um, as well as um, uh, kind of our, our publications as well. And I think we're up to like 35 or so uh, publications or, or uh, published abstracts, I should say. Great, thank you. Um, and then the mm -hmm. next question, someone is asking, I would like to apply for a grant for a project using chip cytometry. Would you recommend a lab contact where I could send the samples to be phenotyped due to, due to not having equipment on site? Absolutely, so what I would suggest is instead, um, if you could reach out to and uh, just contact Canopy Biosciences, um, the reason I, uh, I would give you that too as an answer is because um, that can kind of in parallel uh, give you access to those labs that have this uh, instrument uh, to kind of negotiate that. Uh, and then also uh, talk with one of our representatives uh, about our pilot program. Um, so we have these data sets uh, already available uh, that are they're nice curated data sets. Uh, we're, we're happy to tell you everything about them and they're not uh, by <laughs> curated, I guess, I, I don't mean they're, you know, photoshopped to death or anything like that, um, but they, they tell a story and they give kind of the complete story of chip cytometry. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of that, of course, yeah, we're, we have a pilot program where we can take your samples uh, for, and it's specifically for things like, uh, you know, grant submissions and things like that. Um, so the best thing to do is really just to put an inquiry into uh, um, uh, canopybiosciences.com um, and we can get in contact with you. Thank you. Um, next question here is, what would be the pros and cons compared to doing single cell sequencing? And have you compared the results from both techniques? Yeah, so um, uh, kind of a, a funny aside there, maybe not. So ch uh, chip cytometry and, uh, or I should say, <laughs> excuse me, uh, 
uh, Canopy Biosciences uh, is actually, uh, there's, there's two halves of our business. Uh, one is the uh, instrumentation half, which is Cellscape. Uh, the other half, that was a CRO wing. Um, so that's maybe something else. If the audience is interested, you can contact uh, Canopy uh, Biosciences for, for RNA-seq, for nanostring, for chip cytometry, even, you know, kind of uh, more clinical facing things like IHC and IF. Uh, we actually do all that stuff. Um, but in doing so, actually, we are we're starting to do internal comparisons between single cell uh, uh, RNA-seq and our in chip cytometry. Um, <clears throat> the major difference, again, is that RNA-seq is going to give you that answer in bulk, whereas uh, chip cytometry is going to give you that answer as, as uh, a single cell within the context of the other cells that are around it. Uh, so the, the really the idea there is like do you you know do you need spatial biology or do you just need the bulk transcriptomics or the bulk transcript uh, you know uh, uh, increases and decreases and a lot of times the answer is well yeah I need both um, so uh, at least with the uh, canopy uh, in 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 total rather uh, we can actually give you both of those answers um, and it'd be wonderful to to maybe talk about a project with you that uh, we would collect information like that. Um, the other thing that I, I found uh, very interesting is there were quite a few methods uh, presented at U.S. Uh, spatial biology, as well as uh, there's a really cool conference called SBI2, um, where uh, labs, uh, it's actually the, the Nolan lab particularly, uh, that is looking at methods for um, uh, combining these two types of data sets uh, in silico, uh, which is really, really interesting because it means that you could take your, say, 15 and 20 markers, combine that with an RNA-seq, and actually get a much more exquisite answer uh, for, for both data sets. I find that really exciting. Great. Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more question. Um, what are other benefits of increased resolution? Yeah, sure. Um, so increased resolution in general, um, there's, uh, so there's two major benefits that I see here. So the first that uh, I kind of pointed out there is specifically in the case of what we're offering versus kind of uh, uh, competition, um, as we see the market anyways right now, is it's it's really that jump of saying that this cell has a marker on it to saying this organelle has a marker on it. Uh, so right now, uh, fully admit, this is an analysis that we can run in bulk like we would need to do in order to you know say we do this with chip cytometry. Uh, however, you know, kind of with some of those open source tools I talked about, there are certainly people within the research community that can do this and they can do it right now. Um, the ones that come to mind are, are definitely the, uh, the Allen Institute has a really cool uh, um, uh, program where they do uh, analysis programs like this. Um, <clears throat> but again, being able to answer those types of questions and give those types of questions a spatial context is really, really exciting in my opinion. Um, the second that we've seen kind of concretely um, is that it actually increases your ability to do uh, just raw segmentation. Uh, so again, all, you know, all these technologies, if we're taking a picture, we have to somehow get um, the information out of that picture as to what is a cell. Uh, so that's called segmentation. Uh, the higher the spatial acuity is, the easier it is to actually segment those cells. Um, and we saw this in development of the scalescape where we actually went from, say, 500 nanometers of resolution to 182. And what we found was that we were suddenly getting drastically lower uh, um, uh, expression values. And the reason we were getting those is because um, when you segment on a kind of a fuzzy uh, image, uh, it gives you a lot more leeway as to what you're calling um, kind of the borders of a cell. It was actually including more of the signal of interest, which is in the membrane. So when we had better segmentation, uh, we found that we actually had to then increase the size of that binary to once again include the membrane because we were segmenting too finely uh, close to the nucleus. Um, so it's, you know, maybe illustrates the point, but again, the idea is like the, the better spatial acuity that you have in this image, the more that you can do with it with image analysis. I'd say the same thing goes for HDR imaging. Uh, the higher the, um, the range of signals that you have, the better that you can do uh, segmentation on as well. Thank you again, um, Spencer, for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Canopy Biosciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay.
And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye.